And it is now time for oral questions. I recognize the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you, and good morning, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Um, Speaker, throughout this pandemic, the Conservative government could have applied penalties and fines to long-term care op operators where inspections clearly revealed that they had broken the rules. We know that in 2018, the Liberals brought in penalties but never got around to actually proclaiming them into law. And to make matters worse, this government, after more than three years, still hasn't proclaimed those penalties into law either. So, Speaker, after nearly 4,000 deaths in long-term care, why won't this government proclaim the laws that are already on the books and hold these for-profit homes accountable? Here, here. And uh, the member will know that yesterday we, uh, of course, uh, announced a significant increase in inspections uh, across uh, the province of Ontario for the long-term care sector. Uh, speaker, the member is quite correct uh, that over 15 years the Liberals uh, certainly did not do the work that was needed to ensure that we had a, uh, a strong long-term care sector, and we saw some of the results and the impacts of that at the early stages of the pandemic. Uh, speaker, but but the, honestly, that's why we moved so quickly to ensure that we increase the amount of homes or the amount of beds, uh, 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 increasing it to. 30,000 over the next number of years. That's why we are in increasing the amount of uh, inspectors, a significant increase in the amount of inspectors. That's why we are moving to the highest standard of care in North America, Mr. Speaker, with four hours of, uh, of, uh, of daily care. That's why we are hiring 27,000 additional PSWs, paying for the education of, uh, of PSWs hiring uh, uh, thousands of members, Mr. Speaker. The member is correct. The Liberals did let us down in, in that regard, uh, but we are moving very quickly to ensure that we have a stable, strong long-term care system for the future. Okay. Supplementary question. And, uh, you know, the government House Leader is correct. The Liberals certainly did let us down, but this government had three years to act and they did nothing, Speaker. They could have proclaimed these laws on day one, but they chose not to. In her April 2020 report on long-term care, the Auditor General said she was not impressed by this government's lack of action to move forward with penalties that are already on the books. The Auditor General said this government, and I'll quote, decided to not implement any fines or penalties, end quote, and they raised serious concerns about significant uh, delays in this government's uh, action and the government's decision to take a very supportive role in supporting these bad actors. The Premier has no issue using extraordinary powers to serve his own political purposes, but when it comes to protecting senior speaker, they did nothing. So they could have proclaimed these laws, but they chose not to. So, Speaker, Question. why is this government rewarding the for-profit operators with new beds, 30-year contracts, instead of enforcing penalties that are already on the books? And to reply, the Minister of Long -term Care. I thank the member for the question. And, and Mr. Speaker, this government from day one started to address the problems left by the previous government by committing to build new beds. Mr. Speaker, from day one, this government took a proactive approach to addressing the issues in long-term care, but very specifically to, to the member's question. Mr. Speaker, we've acknowledged and identified, listening to the Long-Term Care Commission, listening to the Auditor General, listening to frontline workers, and listening to the residents and families of long-term care homes, that there need to be changes in the Long-Term Care Act. And that's why, Mr. Speaker, tomorrow we'll be introducing new legislation, and we'll look forward to the feedback from the member. When we look at introducing more transparency, when we look at introducing more accountability. But yesterday, Mr. Speaker, we announced the doubling of the number of inspectors. So I'd ask the member, are you in favour of more enforcement? Response? Are you in favour of the increased powers for inspectors? We know what you're against, but clearly you must think that increasing the number of inspectors and doubling those inspectors is a good thing. So, Mr. Speaker, let's the final supplementary. Speaker, with all due respect to the minister, I know he's still relatively new to the role. There are inspection reports that clearly outline that there are bad actors. What this government is doing is actually rewarding those bad actors with more contracts and public taxpayers' dollars. So the Liberals didn't proclaim these laws um, and, and penalties, and they didn't build enough beds either, Speaker, causing the problems that we have in long-term care. But the horrors in long-term care were exacerbated by this government's inaction. As the Financial Accountability Office re Office's report in May of this year indicates, this government isn't even going to meet their own targets for new beds. 
even when they hand contract after contract and billions of public taxpayers' dollars to the for-profit sector. They are going to miss their own target by nearly 7,000 beds, Speaker. So is the government's plan to provide zero accountability for bad actors and accountability and transparency to Ontarians and then hand these contracts question. over to, uh, to these for-profit providers. And so, Speaker, my question again to the Premier is why is this government never willing to do the right thing to protect seniors and why are they constantly rewarding their friends and insiders? Mr. Long-term Speaker. Mr. Speaker, and the member chose not to talk about uh, the double of inspectors. Mr. Speaker, you know, Smokey Thomas yesterday, the head of OPSU, said this is a government that's listening. Doris Greenspan said this is a government that's listening from the RNAO. But, Mr. Speaker, on the topic of beds, we understand uh, this is why there is an opposition, different sides of the aisle. Right? The opposition, the NDP, they have an ideological aversion to the 140 construction projects that are going on right now, including, including in Oakville the building of 340 beds, including those beds that will be culturally specific to the Sikh and Hindu community, they'd rather see that project stop. Shame. Stop right now. Mr. Speaker, we don't want to see that project stop. We want to see those 140 beds built. Mr. Speaker, we don't want to spend billions of dollars expropriating the assets of private companies, which is what the NDP would do. We want to spend billions of dollars building new beds, $3 billion, Mr. Speaker. We want to spend $4.9 billion adding four hours of staffing, something they've talked about over there, but we're doing. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, we're going to spend the money protecting seniors, yeah. building beds, and making sure accountability is The next question, once again, the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you, Speaker. And my next question is also to the Premier. The same companies running for-profit homes where some, of, where some of the worst outbreaks and deaths were found are actually getting more rewards from this government. At Siena Senior Living, for example, which operates the Woodbridge Vista Care Facility and the Altamount Care Home, 84 seniors passed away in the pandemic. The government didn't issue any penalties to those homes. In fact, the government is giving Siena millions of dollars of taxpayers' dollars as a reward. Speaker, why would the government reward Siena with millions in lucrative contracts when that company hasn't been able to even safely operate the homes that they already have contracts for? Mr. Speaker, the, the tragedy of what happened with COVID-19 is something that we all witnessed. Mr. Speaker, we understand the challenges that happened, not just in long-term care homes here in Ontario, but across Canada and around the world. That is why we appointed a commission, Mr. Speaker, and that commission looked very specifically at issues across the long-term care sector. And they provided recommendations, Mr. Speaker, recommendations like increasing the number of inspectors, recommendations like making sure those inspectors have more authority, Mr. Speaker, recommendations that related to accountability, transparency, and the importance of making sure that enforcement is in place. But, Mr. Speaker, that commission, led by a, a former judge, also talked about the need for more and new beds. Mr. Speaker, the previous government, at one point supported in its minority by the opposition, allowed 611 beds to be built, only 611 beds Response. Built over the period of seven years. Mr. Speaker, we are fixing long-term care. That does involve building new beds. That does involve putting more accountability in place, um, and it does involve a plan that's working. Here, here. <laughs> question. Speaker, the government knows just how badly Siena operated their own homes. Professionals from the William Osler Health System had to actually step in to help manage Woodbridge Vista Home. And at the Altamount home, the Canadian Armed Forces were required to step up. And what they found was a home in disrepair, dirty and damaged walls, overworked staff, and a huge maintenance back backlog. But instead of issuing a single pen penalty to Siena, this Premier brought out the checkbook and offered new lucrative contracts to this for-profit provider. Siena wasn't capable of managing the homes that they already had licenses for, Speaker. So why would the Premier reward Siena with new contracts when they weren't even able to properly manage the long-term care homes that they already had? Mr. Long-term care. Mr. Speaker, under, under the previous government, again at times supported by this, uh, this government, Mr. Speaker, of the 611 beds built, none were built, for example, in Brampton. 
Mr. Speaker, this government is committed to 680 new beds and 120 upgraded beds just in the community of Brampton. Mr. Speaker, you know, the, the, the shareholders of the company that the, uh, that the member is talking about, probably, you're probably rooting her on because they know that what the NDP wants to do is make sure that billions of taxpayers' of dollars go to pay them for their company. We are not in the business of expropriating companies. We're not in the business of putting billions of dollars just to take ownership away from those operators. We're in the business of putting billions of dollars to work, and that's what we're doing, providing more care, four hours of care, 27,000 new staff, Response. providing more beds, 30,000 beds, Mr. Speaker. That's how we will spend the taxpayers' money. That's how we will protect seniors, and that's how we will fix long-term care. And the final supplementary. Speaker, this could have been an opportunity for this province to do better. This could have been an opportunity to move away from for-profit long-term care systems that Liberals and Conservatives both prefer. We could have homes where seniors live and die in dignity. Instead, we have licenses going to an operator where inspectors found a resident not drinking enough fluids. And instead of being offered a glass of water, the senior was given medication that caused further dehydration. That resident later died. Inspectors found that Siena lacked a staffing plan. And instead of a penalty, this government offered Siena new contracts to make even more money. But when asked yesterday by the media what the minister's possible justification would be, he refused to answer. Question. So I'll ask again, why won't the government do the right thing? Stop rewarding their buddies and the private shareholders in for-profit long-term care with lucrative contracts and start protecting seniors and people with disabilities in long-term care. Mr. Long -term care. Mr. Go Mr. Speaker, this, this government is the first government in decades to take the actions necessary to protect seniors. Here, here. And Mr. Speaker, it comes in three parts. Building more beds, 30,000 beds, 20,000 of them are already underway. That's 220 construction projects, 140 of which the member would have a stop today. Mr. Speaker, that's $4.9 billion for four hours of care, 27,000 new staff. I was with the Minister of Colleges and Universities offering another $100 million to bridge P RPNs and PSWs into nursing jobs, $100 million today for 2,000 new nurses. Surely you support that. And, Mr. Speaker, more accountability more enforcement, doubling the number of inspectors. The member likes to talk about inspectors. Would she not think it were better if there would be more of them? Could she say that? No. Mr. Speaker, ideologically driven, want to put billions of dollars through expropriation in the hands of the very private companies they don't like. We're going to put Response. those billions of dollars to work to support seniors. We're going to fix long-term care in this province. Next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This question is for the Premier. Speaker, yesterday the Ontario Science Table released a new report on strategies for increasing COVID-19 vaccine uptake for children and youth. Among other strategies, the research is very clear that school-based vaccination strategies are key, and, I, and they call them, and I want to quote, they call them a high-impact and effective approach for increasing uptake that addresses many practical issues, including reach, convenience, feasibility, accessibility, and equity. Speaker, parents want kids vaccinated as quickly and as efficiently as possible. School boards are already running school-based vaccination clinics for other childhood vaccines. They're just waiting for direction from this government. Approval from Health Canada could come at any moment. Speaker, why are we still waiting for a clear vaccination plan from this government for our 5 to 11 year olds? Reply, Deputy Premier, Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Speaker. Thank you to the member for the question. We have been working on a vaccination plan for children aged 5 to 11 for months now. We recognize that Health Canada approval may be forthcoming very quickly. We have been in contact with our 34 public health units. They have submitted their plans. We are finalizing them with the public health units. Many of those vaccination programs will be carried out in schools, perhaps not during school hours, but after hours and on weekends. So given the fact that we've already had tremendous success with our adult vaccination campaign, we reached 88% of a, a people age 12 and older having received their first dose. This is a significant achievement, and based on the achievement of our adult program, we are going to replicate that success with our children's program for children aged 5 to 11. 
Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. The science table report is crystal clear. It says that boosting the uptake of vaccination among children and youth is going to depend on building and leveraging trust, especially by those in positions of authority. But yesterday, the Premier himself sowed more doubts about vaccines for kids. He said, and I'm going to quote him, he said, I also understand if parents don't want to get their five-year-old or six-year-old vaccinated. Speaker, our younger children are the last segment of our population waiting to be vaccinated. When is this Premier going to stop pandering and start planning to get our kids the protection that they need? Order. Mr. Well, thank you, Speaker. Our government has said since the very beginning when vaccines became available that anyone who is able to receive the vaccine should get the vaccine. The vast majority of people have, with 88 per cent of people age 12 and over already vaccinated with their first dose, and over 84 per cent having received the second doses as well. This will apply to children as well. There may be some children who might not be able to for medical reasons. However, we are encouraging all parents to have their children vaccinated, age 5 to 11, as soon as it becomes available. Uh, by uh, Health Canada's approval. We will be ready to supply those vaccines. We have the orders in, we have the capability to do it, and we are ready to deliver. Just as we've had successfully done with adults, we will successfully do with children as well. Question, the member for Scarborough Aging Court. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. With this year's flu season, approaching, I know many in Scarborough Aging Court have questions surrounding how and where they can get flu shot. Here in Ontario, the flu shot is provided free of charge to everyone. Six months of age and older, who lives, works, and attends school. As we continue to live with COVID-19, it is more important than ever to get the vaccine when it is your turn. I have heard from constituents who are eager to get the flu shots as soon as possible. Speaker, through you, could the Minister of Health tell us how our government is planning to roll out the flu vaccine this year? Thank you. Mr. Health. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Scarborough Aging Court for the question and for your superb work on behalf of all of your constituents. Our government is proud to say that this year will mark the largest seasonal flu shot program in Ontario's history. Building on last year's success, Ontario is investing over $89 million to purchase over 7.6 million flu shots this year, which is 1.4 million more than last year. This includes a total of 1.8 million high-dose vaccines specifically for seniors. Over 5 million doses of the 7.6 million doses ordered have already arrived in Ontario and are being distributed around the province. To protect the most vulnerable, Ontario's initial supply of flu vaccine was prioritized for long-term care home residents and hospital patients beginning in September, and flu shots are now available for seniors and others most at risk for complications from the flu. Flu shots for Response. all Ontarians will be available starting next week through doctor and nurse practitioner offices at participating pharmacies and public health units. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. It is great to hear that we are preparing for a strong demand of flu shots this year and that we have focused on prioritizing the initial supply for the most vulnerable. I personally look forward to booking my flu shot at any local pharmacy when they come available starting next week. Last year, we saw some delays in distribution due to the significant turnout at flu vaccine clinics. So, Speaker, to the Minister, through you, with such high demand this year, what is the minister doing to ensure that is more than enough supply available in Ontario? Mr. Health. Thank you. And speaker, I'm very pleased to report that there are no delays in vaccine shipments by manufacturers. We ordered more doses this year, 
as a result of the increased uptake last season and in recognition of the importance of the flu shot in ending hallway health care and protecting hospital capacity as the province continues to respond to COVID-19. We are being clear that there will be a sufficient supply of flu shots for any Ontarian who wants one. As Chief Medical Officer of Health Dr. Moore has said, the annual flu shot is the best defense against the flu this season. As we head into the fall and begin gathering indoors more often with family and friends, it is even more important to get your flu shot, in addition to following public health measures to protect yourself and those around you. So, Speaker, I encourage everyone to get their flu shot as soon as they can. And I'd like to remind all Response. Ontarians that it is safe to receive the COVID-19 vaccine and the flu shot at the same time. So if you're receiving your flu shot and have yet to receive a first or second dose of a COVID-19 vaccine, please do so as soon as you can. Thank you. Next question, the member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The Centre for Future Work has shown that a universal early learning and child care program phased in over 10 years would facilitate increased labour force participation and employment of up to 725,000 Canadian women in prime parenting years, create over 200,000 jobs in child care centres, increase the Canadian GDP by between $64 and $107 billion, and add $17 to $29 billion to provincial and federal revenues, more than covering the cost of the program. Ontario's astronomical childcare costs are the highest in Canada, yet this government continues to drag its feet and squabble with the federal government. With, will this government stop their theatrics and bring in universal, high-quality, public and not-for-profit $10 a day childcare for the people of Ontario, yes or no? To apply the Minister of Education. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member opposite for the question. We agree child care is too expensive. It was an inherited legacy under the former Liberal government where child care rose by 40 percent. Now, with that said, Speaker, the province in the nation that regrettably has the worst metric when it comes to pricing is the New Democratic province of BC. Uh, we believe as progressive conservatives we can make child care affordable and accessible through a better deal with the federal government. Uh, the member opposite used the word theatrics. I mean, we're negotiating for a better deal when we're talking about potentially leaving as much as $3 billion on the table. I mean, thank goodness the New Democrats, Liberals, are not in the driver's seat in this negotiation. They would have caved to the federal Liberals immediately. We're extracting the best deal, the longest and more sustainable deal, to ensure those, those fees are reduced, not just in year one, but over the course of our mandate to ensure the program is there for moms and dads when they need it so they could afford childcare in this province for good. Speaker, seven provinces and one territory have signed the deal to provide $10 per day child care. And as the Ford government drags its feet on the child care deal, municipalities are stepping up to fill the gap. Last week, Niagara Regional Council passed a motion asking staff to investigate the potential for them to enter into a direct agreement with the federal government to participate in the national child care strategy. Niagara is prepared to treat the child care crisis with the urgency it requires. Municipalities know we need to start building a universal, affordable, quality child care system right away. Will the Premier stop his ideological dithering and say yes to child care? Yes. yes. Mr. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I mean, it's this Premier that's investing $2 billion this year alone to build a more accessible child care system, investing a $1 billion specifically to build 30,000 spaces, which the former government couldn't get done. We've introduced a tax credit to reduce child care costs, given that they rose by 40%. I agree with the member, absolutely unacceptable by any standard. And what did the Premier do in his first year? Introduce a tax credit, which was then enriched, providing roughly $1,500 per child in savings. It will help make a difference, but we recognize there's more we can do, which is why we're at the table with the federal government. But we're standing up to this federal Liberal government to get a better deal for the people we represent in this province. And I would expect the New Democrats, at the least, perhaps not the Liberals, to cave to Justin Trudeau to a demand that this province gets the best possible deal, long-term sustainable funding that moms and dads this province deserve. Next question, member for Orléans. 
Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Uh, for almost 25 years, the residents of Orleans and Ottawa have been stuck with the cash cow that is Highway 174. Highways 174 and 17 function as an enormous regional highway that sees tens of thousands of commuters each and every day. And as we know, Mr. Speaker, previous Conservative governments downloaded Highway 174 onto the backs of Ottawa property taxpayers and never looked back. This decision has sucked tens of millions of dollars out of local road maintenance, out of winter snow clearing, out of repairing potholes and better sidewalks and better cycling infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, earlier this week, I introduced Bill 26, uploading Highways 174 and 17 Act. Now, Mr. Speaker, you can't watch a sporting event without seeing the Premier say that he wants to say yes. Saying yes to Bill 26 will help commuters in Orleans and across eastern Ontario. So, Mr. Speaker, will Question. the Premier say yes? Will this government support Bill 26 and upload Highways 174 and 17? The Associate Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker. You know, just when you think you've heard it all from the Liberals, it's, this is incredible, Speaker. What an ironic question. First of all, the Liberals had 15 years to do something about this, and they did nothing at all. But it doesn't stop there, Speaker. In 2016, the then Transportation Minister, Stephen Del Duca, announced plans to widen parts of Highway 17, but said no when it came to widening Highway 174 in Ottawa. In fact, it was the member from Orléans, Speaker. An Ottawa City Councillor at the time that told the CBC, quote, what's going to happen is you're going to have a four-lane road in Rockland cramped down to a two-lane road in Cumberland and back up to a four-lane road in Orleans. Maybe that's what Rockland residents want, but somehow I doubt it. Speaker, the Liberals are hot and cold, yes and no, and while they're busy making up their minds, we're going to invest in transit and transportation across this entire province. Stop the clock. Order. <laughs> Restart the clock. The supplementary question. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I appreciate the answer from the junior member from Willowdale. My question was for the Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, for nearly 25 years, uh, the Conservatives have kept Highway 174 and 17 uh, with municipal taxpayers in eastern Ontario. And ever since, those highways have been sucking tens of millions of property tax dollars out of road maintenance, out of winter snow clearing, out of better cycling facilities and pedestrian facilities uh, for residents in Ottawa and the counties. Conservatives used to understand the error of their ways, Mr. Speaker. In 2014, the leader of the Ontario Conservatives promised to upload Highway 174 in a letter to Mayor Watson. Let me quote the letter, Mr. Speaker. In our first 100 days in office, we will begin negotiations to upload Highway 174, thereby removing the cost of this route from the city and integrating it into the province's highway planning, Mr. Speaker. It has Question. been 1,216 days since this government took office. 1,216 days, Mr. Speaker, and there has been no action. The Premier, the Premier likes to say yes. Stop the clock. Okay. Government House Leader will come to order. Minister of Economic Development will come to order. Solicitor General will come to order. Member for Kitchener-Conestoga will come to order. Restart the clock. Please conclude your question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Premier likes to say yes, so I would like to hear a yes from the Premier. Le Premier ministre va-t-il enfin dire oui? Will finally the Premier say yes to the residents of Auxerre and say yes to Alfred residents? To the residents of Rockland, to the residents of Ottawa. Question. Will the Premier finally say yes to the residents of Orleans and upload bill, or approve Bill 26 and upload Highways 174 and 17? The Associate Minister of Transportation to respond. Thank you, Speaker. So the member wants to talk about history. Let, let's talk about history. In fact, these challenges for the great people of Ottawa are not new. In 2007, the Liberal government under Dalton McGuinty and Conservative gov uh, government under Stephen Harper made the first commitment to fund $40 million toward the widening of Highway 174 and County Road 17. But guess what, Speaker? The city of Ottawa said no. The member for Orléans come to order. Allow the minister to answer the question. Associate Minister. Speaker, the city of Ottawa said no to that plan, but almost a full decade later, the plan was revived by then Liberal Transportation Minister Stephen Del Duca. But as a councillor, the member from Orleans said no, Speaker. 
I mean, and this is this is incredible here that the member of Orleans tried to get the last Liberal government to upload the highway, but they Order. said no to him too. So, Speaker, this, the Liberal Party can't seem to decide which is yes, which is no, or whether they agree with their own members or not. So, this government will not take lessons from them, but continue expanding transit and Response. transportation across the entire province, including the great city of Ottawa. Next question, the member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Children and Women's Issues. Speaker, every October, children's aid societies across Ontario raise awareness about the role we must all play in supporting vulnerable children, youth, and families in our province. And this is done through our Dress Purple Day campaign. Speaker, families today are dealing with a multitude of challenges, including the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, which continues to create additional stresses for some families. For vulnerable children and youth, these times have posed increased risk for their well-being and safety. Can the minister please tell this House how we are helping to raise awareness for vulnerable children, youth, and their families on Dress Purple Day? Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to thank the member from Eglinton Lawrence for this important question. Keeping children and youth safe is a responsibility that our government takes very seriously along with our Children's Aid Society. In fact, Everyone in Ontario has a role to play in the well-being of children, youth, and families. Through Dress Purple Day, we remind Ontarians that together with other social service providers, children's aid societies, and their help to children, youth, and families who may be facing challenges, Speaker. Dress Purple Day is an opportunity to raise awareness for all of us among children and youth about their right to safety and well-being in all spaces, Speaker. On Dress Purple Day, we celebrate communities and families and remind them that help is available and no one is alone, Speaker. Yeah, yeah. A supplementary question. Back to the Minister. As you can see, members on all sides of this House are dressed in purple to show their support for vulnerable children, youth, and families. And while dressing in purple demonstrates our support for this important campaign and helps to raise awareness of everyone's role in supporting children, there's more that can be done to help address some of the challenges vulnerable children and youth are facing. In addition to the partnership with service providers and Ontario Association of Children's Aid Society's Dress Purple Day campaign, could the minister please advise this House about some of the actions taken by this government to not only protect vulnerable children, but to also ensure that they feel supported? Bond, the Associate Minister. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, the member is quite right. Our focus is not only on protection. We are also working to change the culture of the child welfare system to one that focuses on prevention and early intervention. At the core of our plan to redesign the child welfare system is our goal to strengthen families and communities, Speaker. We're working to make children and family services safe, culturally appropriate, and responsive to the needs of children, youth, and families. I'd also like to recognize the efforts of those who work at children's aid societies. We all face many challenges and pressures we couldn't have imagined, Speaker, 18 months ago. I want to take a moment to thank those who are dedicating their lives to support children and youth in our province. Mm -hmm. Every child in Ontario should feel empowered and supported because when Response. they feel safe and supported, we all benefit, Speaker. Question, the member for Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Premier. The investment by this Premier and his minister to their buddies at Face Drive just stinks. The products the Premier and his minister proclaimed would help Ontarians aren't even in use anymore. And no one can find any actual jobs created by the millions in grants. Some have said that the millions the company received may have contributed to helping the company drive up its stock only to see it come crashing down while company executives sold off shares for millions of dollars. But that's not all. Face Drive's executive vice president kicked thousands of dollars into the PC coffers last year just after the government gave the company millions in public dollars. To the Premier, what jobs in Ontario 
did this multi-million investment create, Question. and how many of the face drive products were actually made in Ontario to date? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. In the depths of the pandemic, when Ontario had almost no PPE capacity, our government launched the $50 million Ontario Together Fund. Now, this helped local companies retool their operations to produce PPE critical supplies and develop technology-driven solutions and services. Now, like all submissions to the Ontario Together Fund, this proposal was assessed by ministry officials using internal experts as well as external, independent and third-party institutions. And in additionally, in this case, this also included two university professors who provided their expertise. Now, in order to ensure value for money, the ministry has safeguards against a company's performance. And that includes a holdback of funding, covenants around project completion, Response. and a requirement to have an independent auditor confirm that the investment was made in accordance with the funding agreement. If the company falls short, the ministry can take appropriate action. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Premier. It's not just us who are raising concerns about this investment, Speaker. On the government's promo video for Base Drive, which the company, sorry, which the company posted on social media, the Ottawa Centre Progressive Conservatives weighed in. They wrote on February 24th of this year, and I quote, "What is supposed to be the return on the government's quote investment? Investment in air quote speaker, because no one believes that this was a good investment to create jobs and keep Ontarians safe." And even the government's own party members are wondering what return on investment taxpayers got for the millions that the Premier dumped into their coffers. So, what did Ontarians get out of this cash to the Premier's corporate buddies, besides a bunch of trackers no longer in use the company bought off the shelf in China? Minister of Economic Development. Thank you, Speaker. From day one. Our government has been focused on keeping the people of Ontario safe, and that's why we introduced programs like the Ontario Together Fund. The intention is to lower the hurdle for domestic companies to begin to support Ontario's ongoing response to the pandemic. The program Order. supported 45 projects and leveraged more than $187 million in private sector investments, and that has allowed us to reduce our dependence on unreliable supply chains. In fact, before Order. the pandemic, very little PPE was made here in the province of Ontario. And as of today, 74 per cent of our PPE is purchased domestically, and most of it here in the province of Ontario. Now, it's unfortunate, Speaker, that the member and his party voted against the second round of $50 million uh, for essential goods that were, are made in Canada. They said no to supporting critical manufacturers in places like Hamilton and Scarborough. It's only our government, Speaker, that continues to provide. The member for Orleans will come to order. The member for Davenport come to order. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And my question is for the Premier. Good morning, Premier. Speaker, it's perfectly reasonable for families to expect that the person who's caring for a loved one at their bedside in a hospital or in home care, that that person's been vaccinated. It's a perfectly reasonable expectation. Does the Premier agree, yes or no? And to apply, Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. What uh, people should expect is that they will be protected we, uh, against COVID-19. We have uh, said that from the beginning, that the health and welfare of all Ontarians is our primary goal. We've had a very successful vaccination campaign. As I indicated earlier, 88% of people aged 12 and older in Ontario have received at least a first dose, and 84% have received a second dose. We expect and we are asking everyone in Ontario who is able to receive the vaccine to do so. And as indicated, the vast majority of people have, as have the vast majority of people in health care. However, as the member knows, there are other concerns that we have to be thinking about as we make this decision with respect to mandatory vaccination or not. And that is with respect to the number of people who are not being vaccinated. 
They, though they still have to be tested on a regular basis before they go into work to make sure that everyone is safety and health, safe and healthy, we still need to be concerned about the number of people who would leave if we brought in forward a mandatory vaccination program, and that is why the Premier has written to hospitals, has written to health care organizations to understand the ramifications Response. of such a decision. Supplementary question. I appreciate a yes or no from somebody on that side if the Premier is unwilling to, to answer that question. So, Speaker, what's unreasonable is the delay this government has taken. The argument the minister is making, the, their Minister of Long-Term Care says, we need mandatory vaccinations to prevent outbreaks so we won't have staff shortages, and that far outweighs losing any staff. That same principle applies in hospitals, in home care, in schools. It's not any different. So the position that the government's taking and the Premier has taken is unreasonable. Unreasonable. The delay is incredible. And of those organizations that have adopted mandatory hospitals that have adopted mandatory vaccinations, in my writing, CHEO, 99%. Queens Bay Carlton, 97. Here, where we are, UHN, 97. And you know why it works? Because they took action early on and they did the work they needed to to get there. But this government Question. can't figure that out. You haven't been able to figure it out through the whole pandemic. So I just need an answer to the question, Premier, yes or no. Is it reasonable for families to expect that? I invite the members to make their comments through the chair. Minister of Health. In every step possible during the course of this pandemic to protect the health and welfare of all Ontarians. The member is correct that there have been some particularly uh, pediatric hospitals where they have required vaccination because of the fact that children cannot be vaccinated right now. The vast majority of their patients are not vaccinated. The situation is different in hospitals, plus the fact that anybody who is working in a hospital who is not vaccinated also has to be tested very regularly. But still, the principle remains the same, that we need to understand and look at the evidence, look at what's happening in all of the hospitals, in all the health care organizations across Ontario, to make a proper decision to ensure that we will have sufficient numbers of health care professionals that would stay on if a, if a mandatory vaccination program were brought in, to make sure that we can continue Response. to care for the people who already need care in our hospitals and in home care. We need to look at the evidence. Member for Ottawa South, come to order. The next question, the member for Sarnia Lamp. Thank you, uh, thank you, Speaker, and to you and through you to the Solicitor General. It's great to be back at Queen's Park after spending a productive legislative recess in my community of Sarnia Lampton and to hear from my constituents and share how our government is working for the people of the riding. As our government continues this last mile of our vaccination strategy, we know there are more steps that we can take to reach the unvaccinated in communities across Ontario. But we're going to need to be even more creative and strategic in offering Ontarians the most convenient experience when receiving their shot. So, to the Solicitor General, how is our government going to innovate as we vaccinate? The Solicitor General. Well, thank you to the member from Sarnia Lambton. You know, we, we have been very innovative, and I'm very pleased, as the Minister of Health has said a number of times today, we have achieved 88%. Uh, first dose vaccines for 12 and above, uh, which um, and 84% double vaxxed, so fully vaccinated. Uh, that amounts to 21 million doses given out in the province of Ontario. It's an incredible achievement uh, that we have been able to do with partners like the GoVax bus, uh, which is one of the uh, last mile innovations. Uh, it's a Metrolinx partnership. They have retrofitted um, the uh, buses, and we are now visiting smaller communities that have not had the opportunity to have those larger mass immunization clinics, and we're getting the job done. We've now achieved over 10,000 people have been vaccinated first Response. and second dose through the GoVax bus system. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and through you and to you again to the Solicitor General. Thank you for that response. I know that we all agree about the importance of getting vaccinated to protect Ontarians, especially our most vulnerable. My community of Sarnia Lambton looks forward to the opportunity to take advantage of this community-focused vaccination rollout. 
Can the Solicitor General please share when my local community of Sarnia Lambton might expect a, a visit from the GOVAX bus? And the Solicitor General. Absolutely, Speaker. We've actually um, just begun a southwestern uh, tour with the GOVAX bus, so specifically in Sarnia Lambton on October 29th. Uh, the GOVAX bus will be at the Lambton Mall. On October 30th, it will be at Food Basics on Indian Road. And October 31st, it will be at the Moortown Complex in Moortown. Uh, finally, on November 1st, uh, you can visit the GOVAX bus at the Pet Petrolia Farmers Market Pavilion. You know, I know the member from Sarnia and Lambton has been critically important leader in his community, encouraging people to go out and get those vaccines. And now you have another opportunity with the GOBUS system. So thank you very much. Next question, the member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is about, uh, it's to the Premier. And my uh, question is about Tin. Tin lives in a rental home in Clarington, Ontario. He's lived in his rental home for only a year and a half but he now faces a rent increase of $1,100 starting January 1. Now he's facing that rent increase of 57% because this government cut rent control on buildings built after 2018. It's been three years since this government has been in power and housing affordability during this time has gone from bad to worse. Nearly half of Ontarians pay rent they cannot afford. Renters like Tian don't know what to do. They can't afford to stay in their rental homes, but they also can't afford to stay. So this is my question to the Premier. What is your plan to make homes more affordable for renters now? Good question. <laughs> Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, uh, as I mentioned uh, yesterday, of course, we started uh, on this path uh, uh, the moment we were elected into government because we knew how expensive it was for, uh, uh, for renters, uh, Speaker. We knew that we had to unleash opportunity in more areas of the province to, to, build on, to bring on new supply uh, onto the market, uh, Speaker. Ultimately, uh, by adding more supply and by more opportunities, we will find that rents will continue to go down. That was something, another one of these failures, consistent failures that we had from the previous Liberal government, there was just no no supply that was brought online, Speaker, and that has caused rents to go up. Now, of course, rent controls are still in place, Mr. Speaker. Of course, during the pandemic, we uh, stayed uh, uh, evictions, and I think uh, that was very important. But we understand how important it is to continue down this path of making life more affordable for the people of the province of Ontario. I think that tenant and the people of the province of Ontario understand that it is this side of the House that will work on making life more affordable for them, and certainly Response. not that side of the House. Speaker. And a supplementary question. My question is back to the Premier. A new report recently came out revealing that multiple property owners make up the largest segment of home buyers in today's utterly unaffordable housing market. Now, this report came out in the back of recent controversy about Core Development Group. This company is buying up a billion dollars worth of single family homes only to rent them out to the very same segment of people that would prefer to own them. People want to pay off their own mortgage. They don't want to pay off someone else's mortgage. So our housing sector very clearly is now catering to investors intent on profit over first-time home buyers who have scrimped and saved for years for a down payment, only to find that their down payment in this market is never big enough. So this really gets to that question of supply, because we can't build new homes without addressing the issue of who is buying the homes that we built. So this question. is my question to the Premier. What is your plan to clamp down on investor-led housing speculation so first-time home buyers have a shot? There you go. <laughs> Uh, again, Mr. Speaker, uh, I think at the heart of the matter is and whether it's long-term care, whether it's housing, whether it's investments in, uh, uh, in for small, medium, and large job creators. What you hear is the uh, the NDP are against any type of investment. Anybody who wants to make an investment to help our economy grow, to help people get ahead, the NDP will be against that investment. I'm not against people who want to make, uh, who want to invest in the province of Ontario, who want to bring on new housing supply. I'm not against them. I want to encourage them, Mr. Speaker. I want to encourage them to build in Ontario, because if we bring more supply online, housing will be less expensive. There will be more opportunities for people to rent. And ultimately, the people that I know that rent want to one day own their own home, and they have to be able to do that 
here in the province of Ontario, and that is why we have been working since day one to ensure that happens. Transit-oriented communities, in particular, is a way of doing this, Mr. Speaker. They, of course, voted against that. But as I said the other day, we are going to soldier on. We're going to continue to invest uh, in things like transit-oriented communities so we can bring more supply online and so that renter can one day be a homeowner. Next question, the member for Glengarry Prescott-Russell. Thank you, Mr. President. It's been three, year, three years ago, as soon as he took office, the Conservative Premier cut, cut, cut. I even have a seeker here that reads. L'intervenant provincial en faveur des enfants et des jeunes, le commissaire au service en français. The Environment Commissioner, the professional advocate for children, and you, the French Language service, Services Commissioner, don't bother, just cut it, without explanation, without justification. Still today, three years later, we have no idea how much money the government has saved. Why does the government take so much pleasure in cutting everything that is good for the environment, for francophones, for young people? How much money has it actually saved with these ideological commissioner cuts? I said it many times in the House. We invested a lot for francophones, thanks to this government, like I said. Last week, it is just a question of having a flag. We are talking about investment. And the Minister of Francophone Affairs started a new initiative for small francophone businesses. Important in the community. As I said on a number of occasions, uh, the, the issues that face the francophone community are the same issues that face all Ontarians. It's about jobs, economic growth, Mr. Speaker and on every measure that matters, not only to the Francophone community, but to all Ontarians, we are making progress, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and I, I appreciate the member's question. Later on today, there'll be another opportunity to support the Francophone community, and I hope the member's Response. office will vote in favour of that uh, motion. Supplementary. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honestly, we are not going to pretend that the government has made progress in these areas. Another matter that makes no sense, Mr. Speaker, the government still has not signed an agreement with the federal government regarding child care services at $10 per day. Why is the government still refusing to sign a deal with the federal government? Why does this conservative government insist on keeping women at home, pushing their ideology to the detriment of women all across Ontario and the economy? Minister of Education. Uh, Mr. Speaker, what is abundantly clear is that the provincial Liberal government would have caved to a deal that is not in keeping with the best interests of families. It's quite obvious you would not have stood up to Justin Trudeau. You would have taken the first deal available to the province, and this Premier and government is standing up for the people we Order. represent to get a better deal, a larger investment over a longer period of time that families in this province deserve. Question, the member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. It's been exactly a thousand days since the government received the report on the third review of the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, written by the Honourable David Onley. The Onley report is scathing in its indictment of Ontario's glacial progress on accessibility. Onley writes in the introduction, quote, Speaker, Ontario is full of soul-crushing barriers for 2.6 million Ontarians with disabilities. They confront those every day. But instead of treating the Onley report like the wake-up call it is, the government has let this report collect dust on the shelf. They haven't released a plan to implement its recommendations, including building accessibility standards, accessibility training for design professionals, and making sure that public money is never again used to create barriers for people with disabilities. But most insultingly, Speaker, when I tabled a May 2019 motion to create an action plan, this government's members called that plan red tape. People with disabilities remain insulted by the lack of momentum on this report. Can we expect Question. an imminent and urgent plan to implement the Honourable David Onley's recommendations? Government House Leader. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the, the question from the Honourable Member. It is a, it's an important question. It is something that uh, uh, I know the, uh, the Minister has been uh, seized with uh, since, uh, since day one. It again highlights, as so many of the questions today have done, highlights the ineptitude of 15 years of Liberal government uh, uh, that preceded this government and the amount of hard work that has to be done to bring Ontario back to a place where we can all be proud of, uh, of what we've accomplished. Now, I, I agree with the Honourable Member. David Onley, in particular, uh, uh, Speaker, is uh, 
uh, a lieutenant governor who, who, who broke boundaries in this, in this province. Uh, uh, and the report is a, is a very important one. We all want to ensure that we, uh, we, we do better uh, for those persons with disabilities, uh, Mr. Speaker. I know that, uh, again, as I said, uh, the minister has been working very closely with the community. I know that he values the advice of the honourable member uh, uh, opposite, and uh, my understanding is that he has reached out to him often, Mr. Speaker. Uh, again, it's not really a partisan issue. I know the member Response. will agree with that. It's something that we have to work on together as a legislature, uh, Mr. Speaker, and it has to involve partnerships with uh, our uh, with our friends at the municipal level as well as the federal level. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. I appreciate that response, but the, uh, the government has an opportunity today to clear up, clear up a glaring problem, and that is that the last time we had a fulsome debate on this in this House, in May 2019, members of this government called a task plan, a plan of action, red tape. I invite the government today to clarify that that was a mistake to clarify that having an action plan on the Honourable David on these recommendations is essential, and to make sure that it's important to say yes to people with disabilities. So not no in making people on ODSP continue to live in poverty, not no in refusing to mandate accessible housing in our marketplace, not no in telling people with disabilities they have to shelter in their homes because their apartments and their living conditions are not accessible. We need yes. From, for people with disabilities, can I please have a clear, certain, absolute answer from this government that people with disabilities and their needs are not red tape? Uh, yeah, yes, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Guelph. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The cost of the climate crisis are escalating. The tornado that hit Barrie this summer caused $75 million worth of damages. A rainstorm three hours in the city of Toronto in 2018, $80 million. Six First Nations communities were evacuated this summer due to forest fires. Poor air quality across the province threatened people's health. Yet climate pollution is going up, not down in Ontario. Pivotal climate negotiations begin next week, and it's vital that Canada's largest province show leadership. So, Speaker, will the Premier commit to sending his minister to COP26 to commit Ontario to cutting the climate pollution in half by 2030 and being net zero by 2045 so we can meet our climate Question. obligations and attract investment and jobs in the green economy? The parliamentary assistant, member for Barry Thank you. Uh, thank you, Speaker. There's there's a lot in that question, but. Uh uh, more importantly, I wanted to talk about uh, his question about the tornado uh, hat that hit Barrie, which is, uh, of course, the community that I'm very humbly and honoured to represent. And my heart goes out to all those families that were affected. I know this government uh, worked day in and day out to help uh, those uh, those residents. I was on the ground doing multiple cleanups. We had the Premier come in. Thank you to the Solicitor General and um, our Attorney General who came uh, to the forefront as well to help those families. But that is why, at the very beginning, we talked about the need for a climate impact assessment, because every community is very different. And we we know that Barrie is prone to tornadoes, and that shows the importance of the climate impact assessment, which is, which is the first of its kind uh, in the province of Ontario, and we're working with all municipalities in order to get that climate impact assessment up and going, because we understand in this government that we need to uh, be investing in our future. It's going to be things like uh, you know, the climate impact assessment is going to be incredible resilient infrastructure. We have $3.7 billion we put in green bonds to help with such infrastructure, Spons? but unfortunately the member voted against that type of investment. Thank you. Speaker, of course, we need to study the impact of the climate of the climate crisis. Of course, our hearts go out to the people in Barrie, the people in northern Ontario, the people who have been affected by flooding. Of course, our hearts go out to all those people. But we have an obligation, Speaker, to make the necessary investments in reducing climate pollution so we avoid the climate impacts the government wants to assess. But instead, this government has ripped up charging stations. They're ramping up gas plants and climate pollution. They're supercharging sprawl with Highway 413. So, Speaker, I'm going to ask the government to make a commitment. On the eve of pivotal international negotiations, to say no to Highway 413 Question. and yes 
to reducing climate pollution. Member for Barry Ennisville. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Speaker. We have said yes every step of the way to reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, which is why we're building transit, getting transit-oriented communities and also getting more people on transit, creating different opportunities for the way transit works, whether someone wants to take a GO train or they want to uh, charge their EV vehicle. We have a Minister of Economic Development that's working on an incredible strategy to use the natural resources we have in this province, whether it's uh, Temiskamin that's going to be building a culvert, whether, whether it's going to be Red Lake that has the lithium. Uh, we both have an economic economic strategy and an environment strategy on the side of the House. But every time and time again when we're trying to get things like more cars off the road, the member opposite uh, opposes it. We know that 80 percent of greenhouse gas emissions come from the transit sector alone, and we know how much idling contributes to greenhouse gas emissions, which is why we know the very importance of investing in uh, clean infrastructure as well as uh, supporting our highway peers, where, of course, many ministers go attend and they do a lot of uh, tree planting along that, uh, along that highway. Speaker, we're balancing the economy and the environment. Thank you. The next question, member for Spadina, Fort York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Premier. Jack Nigro recently moved into a condo in my riding of Spadina, Fort York, and he's doing his part for the environment. He owns an electric vehicle, but he's found the cost of installing an electrical, electric vehicle charging station into his condo parking spot prohibitively expensive. The Ontario NDP is committed to providing households with $600 to, to install a charging station at home. We've committed to mandating ma vehicle charging capacity in new homes, and we've committed to building charging stations at GO stations and along roadways in this province. Since the Conservative government was elected, they have cancelled the electric car rebate, they have ripped electric vehicle charging stations from GO stations, and they have passed legislation that outlaws most e-bikes currently on the road in Ontario. Their policies have led to a 50 per cent decline in, in the sales of electric vehicles in this province and the loss of solar businesses like Ubiquiti Solar. Does the Premier realize that his anti-environmental policies are not only making it difficult for residents to convert to electric vehicles, they are also harming our environment, costing Ontarians thousands of jobs and a chance to be a global leader in the green economy? Thank you. The Minister of Economic Development to respond. Thank you, Speaker. I just want to be able to use this opportunity to talk about the exciting investments that we are making here in the province of in, in Ontario, not only in the critical mineral sector, which is going to be producing um, uh, the cobalt and the lithium and all of the uh, elements, including nickel from Sudbury, in manufacturing. Our dream will be, of course, Premier, to manufacture electric vehicle batteries here in the province of Ontario. We've made a $295 million investment into uh, Ford, into their electric vehicles. You know that General Motors has made uh, announcements of their electric vehicle program in Ingersoll. Stellantis has made a $1.5 billion investment announcement that they've just reaffirmed uh, in Windsor. We are going to be the electric vehicle hub right across North America, Speaker. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period for this morning. Member for Ottawa South has a point of order. Thank you, Speaker. I'd like to correct my record. I meant to mention this morning uh, in my question that the province of Quebec has made vaccinations mandatory for all education workers. Thank you. Pursuant to Standing Order 36A, the member for Ottawa Centre has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Government House Leader concerning the Onley Report, and this matter will be debated today following private members' public business. There being no further business at this time, this House stands in recess until 3 p.m. <laughs>